Hi everyone, so today I'm going to be talking about the history of humus cells and its contribution to medicine. Now, there are thousands of distinct proliferative human cell lines, however, the discovery of naturally occurring human cell lines all begin with the identification of the first immortal human cell line, known as none other than HeLa cells. Now, to understand entirely the unfathomable impact of HeLa cells to medicine, we must begin with the woman behind the cells. Unfortunately, you can't see her, but her name is Henrietta Lacks. She was an African-American woman and born in 1920, a woman described as being so full of life was dying of terminal cervical cancer. Now, upon noticing vaginal blood outside of her menstruation period, she visited John Hopkins Hospital, where she described um, as having um, a knot in her tummy, which is referring to a tumor in her cervix. Now today, cervical cancer is much easier to treat. Treatments often involving hysterectomy, which is the partial or complete removal of the female reproductive tract. Now there are different types of hysterectomies, whether it be um, a total hysterectomy, which is the most frequent operation performed, or radical hysterectomy, etc. However, this wasn't the case back then. So you have Richard Tillens, so he was one of the top cervical cancer experts in the US at the time, this is in the 1950s. Now he did things such as pioneering the use of um, oestrogen to treat symptoms of menopause, as well as making early discoveries about endometriosis. Now um, he correctly argued that carcinoma in situ, which is Latin for cancer in its original place, or you may want to think of it as non-invasive carcinomas, are just an earlier stage of cervical cancer. Now, he, um, he gained a lot of backlash because he would often treat um, in non-invasive carcinomas with um, hysterectomies when a lot of people argued that you can just send them home, like, it's not that deep. <laughs> so unfortunately, you can't see it, but you have invasive carcinomas and non-invasive carcinomas. As I explained, Carcinoma Institute is Latin for cancer in its original place. Essentially what that is describing is how the cancer has yet to penetrate the surface of the cervix and spread to surrounding tissues. Now with um, invasive cervical cancer, that is cancer that has spread from the surface of the cervix to tissue deeper in the cervix or other parts of the body. Now, Without um, informing Henrietta, doctors took a sample of cells from her, the tumour in her cervix and what they did was that they gave this sample to Dr George Guy. Now he was a very prominent cancer and virus researcher who was very determined to cultivate the first immortal human cell line and would soon later prove successful. Now, previously they had tried to cultivate immortal human cell lines, however, they would, all, they would always fail and if they were to succeed, these cells would usually die after a couple of days or a couple of weeks in vitro, so in a test tube. However, what made HeLa cells different was that they had an overactive telomerase enzyme. Now, naturally, our cells, they age and as they divide the ends of the chromosome called the telomeres, they get shorter. Now, if they get too short, then um, the cell can no longer divide and it becomes inactive or senescent or apoptosis may occur, which is programmed cell death. Now, essentially, by having that overactive um, telomerase enzyme, it meant that the ends of the chromosomes wouldn't shorten and they would keep getting extended, which essentially meant that it would prevent cellular aging and death in cells, which in short means that Henrietta cells would never stop dividing and be immortal. Now, this would soon change medicine forever, as doctors having this unlimited resource of human cells that they could easily replenish as it keeps dividing would soon change medical research as they could test vaccines. Now, the first would be polio eradication. Now, at the time of Henrietta's death in the 50s, polio was one of the most devastating viral diseases. Um, there are many different types of polio. For example, to name one of the deadliest would be paralytic poliomyelitis. And essentially what happens is the virus attacks the brain and the spinal cord. And what that can do is it paralyzes the muscles that allow you to breathe, to speak, to swallow, and to move your limbs. Now, previously, doctors and scientists would, text, would test the vaccine sorry, on rhesus monkey cells. Now, these were a very limited resource and they were very expensive. Now, on the other hand, you had healer cells. A, they were easily accessible. B, they were in large quantities and in fact, they were very cheap at the time. Dr. George Guy, who cultivated these cells, would even give out vials for free. 
and lastly they were immortal. Now this was very ideal as doctors needed cells that could be susceptible to the virus however wouldn't easily die because when testing the vaccine they would kill cells in the process and once again monkey cells very expensive. Now what this did was that it paved the way for the creation of the vaccine and eradicated polio. Next up we have cervical cancer. So the discovery of HeLa cells has furthered um, research into cervical cancer. Now cervical cancer is caused by none other than human papilloma virus. Now um, this is spread sexually, um, skin to skin contact, usually through sex. Now um, infections caused by HPV are very, very common. In fact, about 80% of us will probably get that infection. However, it only becomes a problem when you get infected by strains that are high risk for cervical cancer. Now, there are hundreds of strains of cervical cancer. However, there are only a couple that are um, high risk for cervical cancer. For example, HPV 16 and HPV 18 remain responsible for over 70% of cervical cancer cases worldwide. Now, the virus's cancer causing ability is linked to two proteins that it produces. Um, and these viral proteins target and destroy two very important human cells, human proteins, sorry. And that is P53 and retinoblastoma, abbreviated to RB. Now, essentially what they do is that they are sentinels, making sure that cells don't accumulate harmful genetic mutations and ensure that they stop dividing after a set amount of cycles. Now, usually our cells divide anywhere between 40 to 60 times, usually 50 times on average. However, what HPV does is that it makes sure that these cells can continue to divide. Um, and as we all know, the accumulation of cells leads to the formation of a tumour and that leads to cancer. Now, they found the strain HPV-18 in HeLa cells, which allowed scientists to establish a link between the presence of human papilloma virus and cervical cancer. Now, my last point is how HeLa cells have opened up discussions about medical ethics and code of conduct in healthcare settings. Now, back then in the 50s, there wasn't a lot of um, ethical discussions being opened up. For example, the disparity between the treatments between black Americans and to their white counterparts. For instance, Henrietta had to travel to John Hopkins Hospital, which is much further away, because it was one of the very few hospitals that would actually treat non-white people. On top of that, when they drew blood from her, they would label the virals with coloured in order to separate it from the white people's blood. Now, we all know that today there are many laws that have been implemented, whether it be the Civil Rights Act in the US, where all of this took place um, in 1964, which prohibited physicians and hospitals to discriminate against their patients in any aspect. However, back then, there wasn't a lot of codes being put into place. Another example which don't have any relevance to HeLa cells, but I think really does shed light to how a lot of people would um, ignore and neglect um, medical ethics would be the Nuremberg trials. Now this took place about a decade and a half before the HeLa cells came into place. Now essentially what happened was that there was a US-led international war tribunal in Nuremberg, Germany, just after the um, Second World War. They had sentenced seven Nazi doctors to death by hanging. Essentially what they did was that they carried out unthinkable and unfathomable experiments to Jewish people. One of the most popular ones that you may be familiar with would be how they sewed two twins together to create Siamese twins. On top of that, they would dissect people alive in order to study organ function. Now today we all know that patients that take part in an experiment, they must consent to this. Of course, they would take people from concentration camps and experiment on them. Now another example that I want to talk about would be Dr. Chester Southern. Now what he did was he injected HeLa cells and other cancerous cells into patients, whether it be cancer patients or just healthy prisoners. Now, he, after doing so, he would even inject them into gynaecologic surgery patients, stating that he was going to test them for cancer, rather than telling them that he was injecting them with it. Now, what brought this idea about was that they um, had done previous experiments where they had injected cancerous cells into rats and discovered that they would um, cause a tumour to form. And a lot of scientists were working in close proximity with HeLa cells, and that raised, aware that raised concerns, sorry, um, about whether cancer could be caught from HeLa cells. Now, of course, we know HeLa cells, um, not HeLa cells, sorry, cancer is not a virus, so we can't catch it. However, that was not the case back then. Um, 
So Southern gave multiple cancer cell injections to each prisoner and unlike the terminally ill patients, those men fought off the cancer completely. Now with this idea, he thought that um, he could create some sort of vaccine against cancer. Of course, again, cancer is not a virus, so you can't create a vaccine against it. Now, when Truth came out, people asked, well, why didn't you inform them? Informed consent is so important in healthcare settings. He said that if he were to have told them, then the term cancer would have brought about phobia and ignorance and would have forced the patients to opt out of the experiment and, of course, would have been an inconvenience for him and his results. Now, what that there does is that it um, sheds a lot of light to the importance of, con of informed consent and of course you can't see it but here are a few points of discussion so the first thing i want to ask you guys anyone's um, allowed to answer were the doctors really in the wrong now considering the unfathomable impact of healer cells to medicine all of the vaccines it has led to can you really think that the doctors were 100 percent in the wrong for what they did anyone want to answer yeah they are they how come have exactly they don't have consent um would modern medicine be more or less developed with or without healer cells so if they weren't to have cultivated the first immortal um, cell line would modern medicine still be as developed as it was today nope yeah yeah i want to diverge from the second point to the first mm -hmm. point kind of like mix them together yeah but i don't think doctors can be seen as wrong if they, they if they're allowed to bring out a development in modern um, medicine because without the use of informed consent perhaps they were able to gain more insight more knowledge and, and as the doctor said that oh if they had cancer there'll be um there'll be a phobia around it then we wouldn't have learned more about cancer we maybe still thought it might have been a virus so that concludes um, my story on how uh, one woman's death led to thousands of others' lives being saved. Thank you.